Hi, this is Stephen Gray from Michigan State University, and I'm here with someone. Hey, I'm Allison Singer again. And this is the third video that Alice and I are making about the mental modeler software. In the first video, we talked about what fuzzy cognitive maps are in general. In the second video, we did a brief demonstration on how you could use the software to make simple models and run scenarios uh, of a farm. And this one is about what can mental modeler be good for. So there's two ways in which uh, the software is uh, intended to be useful. One is in a research context to understand and capture the diversity of people's understanding or knowledge about a specific issue. And the second context, we can use this understanding collected from a bunch of different people uh, in a planning context so that everybody can share their mental models and we can understand how knowledge varies uh, based on different stakeholder groups or different types of experts. And of course, these are not exclusive to one another. There's kind of an iterative process of interviewing and talking with people to capture their mental models and then reviewing everybody's mental models together, you know, of course, in the context or, uh, of fuzzy cognitive mapping. So we've collected a little bit of information about who it is uh, that has been downloading the software over the last couple of years since it's been available and what they've used it for. And this is a word cloud that shows that clearly people are using it for management decision making. Um, also in education, ecology, some of the sciences in terms of science and STEM education. But clearly there's a, there's a bias toward uh, using this as a planning tool for management decision making. So Allison and I just got back uh, from running some workshops where we use the software in Oregon uh, with a, a series of community stakeholder groups modeling exercises um, that are all affected by the wildfires that are going on in Oregon. And that's Allison's fire noise because Oregon, uh, like many places that are forested, uh, densely forested in the Pacific Northwest, are currently impacted by wildfires. <laughs> I won't do it every time he uses that word. And the interesting thing about it is there's a lot of controversy. Uh, wildfires, uh, uncontrollable wildfires uh, are happening. Um, so that's one type of fire that's on the landscape. But also federal land managers are using fire to reduce the fuel loads that feed the large uncontrollable fires. And so there are several different stakeholder groups that kind of hold knowledge and beliefs about the dynamics of fire and how it's used in their community. Uh, on the top left, you see uh, municipalities um, are certainly municipal decision makers are impacted um, by different af aspects of both controlled burns that are done to reduce those uncontrollable fires, but also the uncontrollable wildfires themselves. There are conservation groups and scientists uh, that are working to preserve large pieces of forest that are also impacted and have a, a, an understanding. There are private landowners uh, that own large areas of kind of remote forested areas that are also impacted. And there are also federal managers such as the uh, U.S. Forest Service that are using fire but also combating fire. So we wanted to understand how these different stakeholder groups view the use of fires differently in a planning process. So we held uh, four different workshops with these different groups, and in each one we gave them a little bit of background about what we were trying to do, the dynamics of the system we were trying to model, and we walked them through a process of collaboratively modeling by capturing the discourse that was happening in the group to understand how things like uh, controlled burning, natural ignition management, um, this notion of wildfire suppression mode impacted things like smoke and public health, economic health, and other things. What we ended up with were fairly complex models from each of the group. And these took about, uh, what, an hour to make? Yeah, an hour at most. So the workshops had, were two hours total. The first uh, hour was about discussion um, of the fire issue, what we were trying to do, just a very simple introduction to how to make these cognitive maps. And then uh, we captured that conversation, asked for a lot of clarification, video recorded it, and came up with four different models, one for each group. And these groups uh, varied in size, but they were all between about three and ten people. That, uh, that, that's about, I think that's fair. Um, I thought, maybe I'm biased, but I felt like everyone was pretty engaged with it. Uh, yes. I do not think anyone was intimidated by the process. 
Not once it was explained. Yeah, <laughs> which does take a little while. <laughs> this is true. Um, and so now we're going to go over just some of the data we caught just to give you an idea of how this might be useful and how we're using uh, the software in our research context. So for the municipal decision makers, um, you can kind of see that this is the model that they developed. Um, by using some of the metrics available in Mental Modeler, we can look at uh, how the structure of their model and what they included differed from the other groups. And a lot of the discussion from the community side was focused on uh, this, these central concepts, which are the ones with the highest centrality scores. Um, you can see the video before this to understand how those are calculated. Uh, looking at things like public acceptance of the policy was very important. Uh, the role of outreach and education, community stewardship, things like smoke, which they were impacted by. And you can also identify things like the driver. We can infer things uh, about their beliefs about wildfire by looking at things like the driver. So science, science and technical information was seen as, as very important in driving the dynamics of these other, these other factors. When we run the scenario of increasing uh, prescribed or controlled burns in the area, we can see how the community anticipates being impacted by it. So they see that when you increase controlled burning, smoke is going to increase, uh, forest health overall is going to increase, so they see a benefit of doing it, um, but it's also going to increase personal risks and it's going to decrease public health. When we look at the conservation and kind of the ecological experts model, they understandably, given their different focus and expertise, they focused on kind of ecological dynamics of uh, related to these two policies. Central to that were things like ecological integrity, wildlife population, and they uh, spent a lot of time talking about the carbon dynamics that fire contributed to. And it, again, we're running the same scenario of increasing prescribed burns. We see that because of their expertise differed, because how they define the system differed, their predicted response differs. Uh, they, again, spent a lot of time talking about how it affects uh, carbon and restoration of snag forests, landscape, heterogeneity, and so on. Large, large private landowners were primarily concerned about risks to the community, um, leadership from manage, managers and uh, those that are involved in controlled burns, um, how different landowners interact with one another, which I thought was very interesting. So the personalities of the people who own these large tracts of land, um, how that personality led to how they manage their land and how they, they manage their land led to overall risk of wildfire impacts. And one of the things that they were very concerned about instead of a driver, we included personal liability because they were very concerned about this. When we run the same scenario on their model, we see that uh, they do see the benefits of controlled bird. Watershed health increases, but it also comes at the cost of personal liability, which also increased. Also increasing our, the risk to the community at large. And it has an initial uh, impact on the aesthetics of the area. Not surprisingly, when you burn the area, it's not quite as pretty as a forest. <laughs> The U.S. Forest Service, which uh, represents kind of federal land management agencies, was very concerned about public acceptance of these things, uh, the complexity of a management decision when they decide to burn, which uh, compared when they decide not to burn, which had to do with uh, weather conditions, whether it was conducive to that management strategy or a fire might get out of control. Um, and so you can see that in one of the drivers is really whether or not the conditions, the weather conditions are favorable for controlled burns. Uh -huh. Weather the weather. Okay. Uh, and you can see when you run their model, um, they, some of these things become clear. So they see an increase in forest resilience because of increasing the controlled burn and increasing in smoke, but also an increase in their personal liability. And what was interesting is they talked about the risk to the decision maker, the risk to the decision maker that has to make the decision, go ahead and burn this area on this day. Uh, because if it did get out of control, then clearly it's going to come back to them. And also risk to human health, risk to firefighters. So in summary, uh, different stakeholders and decision makers hold different expertise. So they, each one of the groups that we talked to 
uh, were expert groups, but about a different part of this issue. And it's our hope that we can bring together all this different expertise in one model to better understand the complexities of this. Um, these differences in the, their expertise and knowledge influence their predicted impacts of the same in policy enactment. We ran the same scenario on each model, but as you saw, the predicted outcomes were very different and in some cases. Um, areas of agreement or disagreement can be used to improve collective understanding. So even in the modeling exercises, there was a lot of uh, battling and conversation about um, how to represent the dynamics until consensus was, re was reached. But it also allows us to look at things like leverage points or points in the system which we can actually uh, change the dynamics and change, hopefully, the outcomes. And hopefully, mental modeler supports representing these different assumptions in an explicit manner that is somewhat uh, efficient because it gives people an external representation of internal assumptions that can be debated. And so we don't get lost in kind of the qualitative ambiguity uh, that often happen in a lot of these stakeholder workshops. So we've used Mental Modeler in several different case studies um, across the world uh, toward different ends, but trying to capture the knowledge of these different stakeholders uh, for collaborative decision making. We've done this uh, in relation to tsunami hazards uh, in communities on the North Shore of Hawaii so that they can come together, model their community, and understand how they're going to be impacted by threats like tsunamis. We've used it in other uh, contexts looking at how the expertise differs um, about ecosystem dynamics um, in, with native peoples, first tribe nations, um, Canadian fishery managers, and other expert groups um, in Canada. We've used it to understand how local coastal systems are going to be impacted by climate change as a way to bring together different marine sectors, so fisheries, um, energy, recreation experts to model their community and then link it to climate change to understand how they're going to be impacted and what they can do to adapt to those changes. We've used it in uh, recreational angling in Germany to understand how different uh, fishery managers uh, think about ecosystem dynamics and how that, those different ways of thinking lead to different management preferences. We've used it in uh, Tanzania, in the Serengeti National Park, to understand how different uh, bushmeat hunters, sellers, and consumers understand the black market trade of uh, zebra and wildebeest. We've used it to understand uh, farmer decision-making in Nepal and in India to understand how different ways of thinking influence different beha farming behaviors and practices. Thank you for listening. Allison, do you have anything to add? No, I think you covered it all.